I just want to say uh, thank you again, first of all, to all the students who participated in that and to all the volunteers who uh, helped make it possible. We're just really grateful for the families and the children we have here in this church, and uh, days like this are a real joy. Hey, if you have your Bibles, today we're in Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 17. in what is one of the most exciting passages in all of the New Testament. Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 17. And forgive me for my bad pronunciation, but here we go. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob. And Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. And Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar. And Perez, the father of Hezron, and Hezron, the father of Ram, and Ram, the father of Amidadab, and Amidadab, the father of Nashon, and Nashon, the father of Selman, and Selman, the father of Boaz, by Rahab, and Boaz, the father of Obed, by Ruth, and Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of David, the king. And David was the father of Solomon, by the wife of Uriah, and Solomon, the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam, the father of Abijah, and Abijah, the father of Asaph, and Asaph, the father of Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat, the father of Joram. And Joram, the father of Uzziah, and Uzziah, the father of Jotham. And Jotham, the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah. And Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh, and Manasseh, the father of Amos. And Amos, the father of Josiah, and Josiah, the father of Jeconiah, and his brothers, at the time of the deportation to Babylon. And after the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel, and Shealtiel was the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel the father of Abiud, and Abiud the father of Eliakim, and Eliakim the father of Azor, Azor the father of Zadok, Zadok the father of Achim, and Achim the father of Eliud, and Eliud the father of Eliezer, and Eliezer the father of Mathan, and Mathan the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations, and from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation of Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations. Did you all catch that? Do I need to read that again? <laughs> okay. Hey, let me open us with a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, as we study for a bit here, I pray, Lord, that we would come to a more complete understanding of who Jesus is and why that's so significant for our life. And I just pray, Lord, that as we look through this passage here this morning, that you would just give me the words to say and that you would speak through me and uh, help me to keep my thoughts clear and that I wouldn't say anything that would be contrary to your written word. Lord, I pray that Christ would be exalted, that this church would be edified, and uh, that you would just bless everyone here. Guide our thoughts, guide our minds. Lord, we need you in everything. So we ask for your help, we ask for your grace. We pray this all in your name. Amen. I'm guessing if you grew up in a church... Uh, around this time of the year, you've probably heard all kinds of sermons uh, from Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 and on. But if you're like me, you probably haven't heard too many sermons on the passage I just read. Or if you're like me, you've probably really never given it too much thought to begin with. But I think we would be making a serious mistake to ignore or to pass over the very beginning of one of the greatest books ever written. 
And that thought in and of itself, I guess, motivated me to take a look at this genealogy and see what we can glean from it this morning. A couple introductory notes about genealogies in general. Uh, if you read through the Bible, you'll see a lot of genealogies. And the reason why that is is because in an ancient Jewish mind, uh, you didn't have any credibility unless you could establish your ancestry. So in terms of like inheritance and property rights, the ability to serve in certain capacities, you had to be able to show and prove uh, your family history, what tribe you're a part of, what family you came from. To give an example, uh, the book of Ezra in the Old Testament, chapter 2, verse 59, there were certain Jews who wanted to serve in the temple, yet they were prohibited from doing so because they couldn't establish their family line. So Matthew is about to tell us uh, He's about to explain the greatest person that's ever walked this earth and tell us who this person is, and yet he starts out with a genealogy basically to establish credibility, that this person that he's going to write about is qualified to uh, meet the claims that Matthew is making throughout his gospel. The second thing about this genealogy in particular is that it doesn't give every generation from Abraham to Jesus Matthew abbreviates, he gives 42 generations. There's more than that, but uh, probably just for purpose of symmetry and uh, to help in memory, Matthew does 14, 14, and 14 generations through three segments of Old Testament history to establish the ancestry of Jesus Christ. Now, with that being said, uh, there's actually a lot in here that just, it comes across as odd or striking in this genealogy. And what I want to say from the outset is that I want to consider with you four points that I think are hinted at in this genealogy, but they're not very clear. I say that because through the sermon you might think that I'm just grasping at straws or speculating but the points that I'm going to make, I believe, are true of this passage. They're at least hinted at here. And we see just how true they are when we consider the rest of Matthew's gospel and the rest of the New Testament as a whole. So it's like Matthew's giving us clues, even in this genealogy, uh, about who Jesus is and the significance of the gospel he's writing. And we certainly don't have time to look at all of them today. And I want to try to keep things just very brief because... We have potluck after this, and I know that's the primary uh, concern today. We want to eat well. But with that being said, I want us to consider briefly uh, who Jesus is from this passage, what he came to do, who he came to do it for, and how he would go about doing it. I think Matthew is giving us hints as to who Jesus is, what he came to do, who he came to do it for, and how he would go about doing it. So with that being said, who is Jesus? Well, Matthew actually tells us explicitly in this genealogy. You notice the word Christ. Verse 1, the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Verse 16, Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. So all the generations to Abraham, or from Abraham to David, verse 17, and from the deportation to Babylon, and to the Christ. There's 14 generations. So right away, Matthew's emphasizing this word Christ. You know, usually when we hear the word Jesus Christ, we think of that as his last name, but it's not his last name. This is a title. It's from the Greek word Christos. It means Messiah or anointed one. The Jews had this expectation that God would send a Christ, a Messiah, into the world to redeem the Jews to redeem the world and establish this kingdom. And Matthew is saying that this is who Jesus is. Furthermore, on that note, notice the first verse. It says, The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So in the very first verse, Matthew wants us to know that Jesus Christ is from the line of David, and from the line of Abraham. 
of all the names that are mentioned in this chapter, those are the two names that seem to be the most important to Matthew because he places those names first, and then after verse 1, he begins to write his genealogy. So it's like he's saying, look at Jesus. He's the son of David. He's the son of Abraham. And it begs the question, why is that so important? Why is it so important that Jesus is a descendant of Abraham and of David? And I think the very brief <laughs> answer to that is that God made monumental promises to both Abraham and David about this descendant that would come from them who would have an impact on the entire world. Uh, I won't make you turn to any verses in your Bible today other than this chapter in Matthew because I want to save time. But listen to what God says to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 through Genesis chapter 22. In chapter 12, verse 3, God says to Abraham, He says, In you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Not by you, but in you, implying a descendant. Furthermore, in Genesis chapter 17, verse 6, God said to Abraham, I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And then again, in Genesis chapter 22, verse 17, it says, God says to Abraham, he says, Your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. God is making this promise to Abraham thousands of years earlier that some descendant who would come from him would be a king. And through this king, the entire world would be blessed. All the families of the earth. And these promises that God made to Abraham, he basically makes the same promises to David who came after Abraham of the same line. In 1 Chronicles chapter 17, verse 11, God says to David, uh, he says, When your days are fulfilled to walk with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, one of your own sons, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for me, and I will establish his throne forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Notice that this descendant of David wouldn't just be a son of David, but he would be a son of God. Throughout the Old Testament, we never figure out who this descendant is, who this Messiah is, but we have all kinds of prophecies that are explaining uh, what he would be like and what he would do. One of the most famous comes from Isaiah chapter 9, which is something that we uh, here around this time of the year, concerning this descendant of Abraham, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government, and of peace there will be no end, and on the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Who is this descendant? Who is this son of Abraham and David? This king who would bless the entire world? Matthew is trying to answer that question beyond a shadow of a doubt that it's this Jesus of Nazareth. He is the one to whom all the Scriptures pointed forward to. All the prophecies and the promises of the Old Testament, they're pointing forward to this person. He is the one through whom God would bless the world and has offered His blessings to you. That's who Jesus is according to Matthew chapter 1, or at least what Matthew chapter 1 hints at, these first 17 verses. Matthew also gives us a hint as to what Jesus came to do. What did he come into the world to do? And I suppose we've already sufficiently answered that just by reading Isaiah chapter 9. He came to bring peace. He came to bring justice. He came to establish 
the throne of God. When he comes again, he will bring that to completion. He'll bring about a new heavens and a new earth. He'll bring about rest. But Matthew gives us a clue, or I guess he gives us an alternative way of looking at the work of Jesus and considering what it means for our life. And I think we see this in the very first verse. Now it says, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. That word genealogy there comes from the Greek word Genesis. The book of the Genesis of Jesus Christ, which means origin or beginning or generation. And what's significant about this wording in Matthew chapter (laughs) 1 is that it's nearly identical to the Greek Old Testament of Genesis chapter 2, verse 4. Genesis chapter 2, verse 4 says, uh, this is the book of the generations or the genealogy of the heavens and the earth when they were created created. This is the book of the genealogy. Second chapter in Genesis. And then you come to the Gospel of Matthew and you read a phrase that you just cannot disconnect from Genesis. What is Matthew trying to do here? He's linking Jesus Christ with the creation account. And what I think he's trying to show us here is that Upon the coming of Jesus Christ into our world, he's bringing about a new beginning, a new genesis. Jesus Christ came to begin the work of a new creation, to give a new beginning to you and everybody who would come to him in in faith. Um, sorry, I'm losing my train of thought if I'm just being honest with you guys. Um, oh, where was I? Hang on, time out. I gotta look at my notes here. Ah, yes. Why that's a good thing. Sorry. Like, I've been kind of coughing my lungs out. And I feel like my mind is kind of cloudy today, and I'm sorry if you can't even understand me. I know I have a scratchy voice, but why is it such a good thing that Jesus Christ is bringing about a new beginning? Why he came to establish the kingdom of God in this world and to uh, give us the right to be born again, as the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 1 through 14 would say. I think the reason why is because this, all of us are longing for a new beginning. We're all longing for a new beginning in life. Like every day we're getting older. Every day our joints are getting more and more sore. Every day we wake up to terrible news. We wake up to suffering and brokenness. Every day we're reminded of all the hurt in this world. Every day we're reminded that this world is just passing away and that all of us are heading to our own graves. We're all heading to our deathbeds. Like this world just isn't how it should be. There's something wrong with this world. And I think we're all longing for a new beginning, a new start to life, a new hope. And (coughs) the glorious promise of the gospel is that in Jesus Christ, God gives us a new beginning. He does a work in our hearts to cause us to be born again, to see the light of life, to have this new perspective, to have this new identity, this new hope. And what Jesus came to do 2,000 years ago, as I said earlier, he'll finish when he comes again. And he'll bring in a new heavens and a new earth, and he'll wipe away every tear. He'll wipe away all suffering, all brokenness, and we'll be raised to life and have glorified bodies, and everything's going to look like it did in Genesis chapter 1, where there's just this garden paradise. You don't have all the evils of the world. In Jesus Christ, that's the hope that we have. 
We have the hope of the world to come. We have the hope of an inheritance that cannot perish. It cannot fade. It's being kept in heaven for us. First Peter chapter 1. And just knowing that, <coughs> that that's the promise that's been given to us through Jesus Christ, just knowing that can give us peace and rest and comfort even now in the midst of all this brokenness and this chaos. You might think that I'm, again, grasping at straws here to say that Matthew chapter 1 reminds us that Jesus is bringing about a new beginning, but we have to remember that this is one of the overarching themes in the entire Gospel of John. Remember how John starts his Gospel? It says Jesus is the true light coming into the world to give life and light to men, to give us the right to become children of God, cause us to be born again. Matthew is hinting at this, even in his genealogy. Okay, who is Jesus? What did he come to do? And... Uh, who did he come to do it for? That is the next thing I want to consider. Who did Jesus come to do it for? And I think Matthew, once again, is giving us a hint in this genealogy. Now, if you go online, you'll find a hundred different articles talking about this genealogy in Matthew chapter 1. You'll find a hundred different opinions and interpretations of this genealogy, but there's one thing that basically everybody agrees on about this genealogy, and it's that Matthew includes women in his list, and that is highly unusual. Once again, the reason why is because the lineage, sorry about that, I didn't mean to wake you up, because the lineage for a Jew was traced through the father, not the mother. So Matthew didn't have to include any women at all in this list. If women were important to establishing one's ancestry, he should have included 42, but he doesn't. But he does include five. Well, four alongside Mary. You have Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Bathsheba. Do you notice that phrase there, that preposition? Uh, Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, by Tamar. Obed, by Ruth. Boaz, by Rahab. It's, it's odd. And Matthew's drawing our attention to these women so what is it about these women? What's unique about them? Is there anything that they have in common? Sorry, guys. This earpiece is like driving me nuts right now. If you haven't been able to figure that out, I um, might have to go back to my chest piece. Anyway, uh, pastoral venting here. A strong case can be made that these four women at the beginning of this genealogy, all of them are non-Jewish. They come from tribes and nations that are hostile to the Jews. Another case can be made that all four of these women were involved in very shady, questionable sexual affairs. And another observation can be made, um, all of them seem to be commended for their faith in spite of their kind of raunchy backgrounds. Tamar, you can find in Genesis chapter 38. You may recall that she is the one that had two husbands, both died. She was a widow twice. Uh, her father-in-law, Judah, was supposed to be taking care of her, but he neglected her. He mistreated her and basically abandoned her. And so what did Tamar do? She disguised herself as a prostitute and basically deceived Judah, her father-in-law, to sleeping with her. And she gets pregnant with twins, one of which becomes an ancestor of Jesus Christ. Rahab doesn't just disguise herself as a prostitute, but you can read about her in Joshua chapter 2. She really is a prostitute, uh, a Canaanite, living in the city walls of Jericho, uh, and yet she allows two spies to lodge with her who came from Israel. <laughs> Ruth, there's an entire book in the Old Testament written about Ruth, and she was a Moabite who married into an Israelite family. She lost her husband. She basically gave up her life to take care of her mother-in-law. But at the end of the book, she, well, seemingly seduced this gentleman named Boaz by 
crawling into bed with him when he was asleep. And that's how they ended up getting together. And then the last woman in here that Matthew mentions is Bathsheba. But you notice that the name Bathsheba actually isn't in here. Look again at verse 6. It says, David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. And just reading that, like you can't help but cringe when you read that. That David had a kid by the wife of somebody else. What does that spell out to you? Affair, of course. You may call the, recall the story of Bathsheba in 2 Samuel chapter 11. Uh, she was married to a Hittite, Uriah. He's out at war. She's out bathing herself. King David's walking on his roof. He takes notice of her. He's overcome by these lustful desires, so he brings her into the palace, and they have an affair. They conceive a son together. David is, he's panic mode at this point, and he's trying to hide this absolutely horrific story. And when he was unable to hide this affair, he sent and had Bathsheba's husband killed out in a battle line. So he takes a man's wife and then murders her husband. Probably one of the most ugly stories in the Old Testament. And yet, David and Bathsheba, they have Solomon, who becomes an ancestor of Jesus. You look at these four women in here, and it brings us back to the question of why in the world would Matthew include these women in his gospel? Why would he include them in his lineage uh, building up to Jesus Christ? It's like you would expect him to pick heroes, you know, Sarah or Rebecca or Leah or somebody. But he takes some of the seemingly worst women with the worst past and the most (laughs) shady stories, and he includes them in this list. And it begs the question, why? And I just think the reason why is to show us the kind of people who Jesus came to save. He didn't come to save those who have their acts together, those who have their lives in order and who don't think they need a Savior. He didn't come to save the best of people. If he did, there would hardly be any good news in the Gospel. But as it is, Jesus came to save even the worst of sinners. God deals with ordinary, broken, sinful, hurting people. That's who Jesus came to redeem, to give a new beginning to, to give a new hope to, to offer forgiveness to. As Jesus himself would say in Matthew chapter 9, verse 13, he didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners. That's who he came for. And finally, Matthew seems to be hinting at how Jesus would accomplish this. Who is Jesus? He's the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He's the Christ. (coughs) What did he come to do? give us a new beginning to establish peace. Who did he come to do it for? Even the worst of sinners. And we're left with this one question that I think Matthew hints at. How would Jesus go about doing it? And I think the hint or the answer to that is in this language called the deportation to Babylon. You may notice that there's only one event described in this entire genealogy. One event, and that's the deportation to Babylon. And it's mentioned three times. And then in verse 17, we have, so all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations. From David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations. Matthew seems to be (laughs) describing all the events of the Old Testament or putting them into three segments of history, before the kings, during the kings, and after the kings. And he keeps bringing up this phrase, the deportation of Babylon, which begs the question, what is it? Because the way Matthew words it, this segment of history 
goes right up to Jesus Christ. It's like that's when the segment of history ends at Jesus Christ. So what is this deportation to Babylon? It reminds us of that very, very ugly time in the history of Israel where they lost everything to the ancient Babylonian Empire. In 586 B.C., the Babylonians came in and they burned the city of Jerusalem to the ground. They flattened the temple. They killed oodles of people and they took the rest captive back to the Babylonian Empire where these people had to live for 70 years in this foreign land. And yet, according to the writers of the Old Testament, the prophets, all this came about (laughs) because of the sins of God's people. The reason why they lost everything, the reason why they were deported to Babylon is because of their own sins, their injustices, their neglect of the sojourners and the foreigners, their unfaithfulness to God himself. And God had warned them time and time again that if they continued to disobey and to turn away from God, that he would basically pull back his hand and let, let them get captured. The deportation to Babylon was a time of judgment. That's what it reminds us of, is God's judgment against sin and wickedness. And even though it only lasted 70 years, Matthew, as I just said, he writes in such a way that it makes us think that this deportation or this exile lasted until the coming of Christ. And he asks, why is that? When Jesus was born in a manger, the Jews were living back in their homeland. And I think the reason why this is is because even though the Jews were living back in their homeland, they were still separated from God. They were still living in exile from God. They were still... S- they needed to be reconciled to God. So how does Jesus do this? How does he reconcile his people back to God? And I think the short answer to that is basically Jesus Christ relived the history of his people. He relived the life that his ancestors lived. You look at the life of Jesus in the Gospels, and there's so many parallels to all the famous people in the Old Testament. And yet, the difference is, is that we're all the, we're all the heroes of the Old Testament had times of failure and times where they just really messed up. Jesus was faithful even to the point of death. He never turned away from God. He kept all the commandments. He was perfect in every way. And yet, just as God's people suffered exile and they lost everything, Jesus Christ would do the same. Just like his ancestors before him, Jesus Christ would suffer his own deportation to Babylon, his own exile. And that took place at the cross. You see, at the cross, Jesus Christ, like his ancestors before him, he lost everything. God turned his back on him. His own people turned their backs on him. He was handed over to this foreign nation called Rome, and he was crucified. And there on that cross, Jesus Christ breathed his last. He suffered as one who was dying for his sins and under the judgment of God. And yet the hope of the gospel is this. Jesus Christ wasn't laying down his life for his own sins, but he was laying down his life for the sins of his people and the sins of the world. Jesus Christ gave up everything for us, even the most broken people, the worst of sinners. On the cross, Jesus Christ stepped into our place, died the death we deserve to die, so that through him, God could offer us the forgiveness of sins, redemption, the hope of eternal life, And for anybody who would trust in Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior, the hope of a new beginning, the hope of a new life, and the hope of eternal life. I hope that as we reflect on the Christmas story over the rest of this month, that we would be reminded of who Jesus truly is, what he came to do, who he came to do it for, 
and what he suffered and what he gave up to do that for us. With that being said, let me close us with a word of prayer, and I'm going to ask the worship team to come forward and to uh, close our time together. (laughs) I just uh, pray, Father, that you would help us to see more clearly who Jesus is, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, Son of man, Son of God, Emmanuel, God with us, I pray, Father, that it would bring joy to our life knowing the salvation that we have in Jesus, even people like Rahab and Tamar. and um, Lord, there's nobody beyond your reach. You came even for the tax collectors and the Gentiles. We're grateful, and I just pray, Lord, that you would bless the lunch ahead and just the rest of this day, and uh, we give it to you. It's in the name of Christ. Amen. Whoever exalts himself shall be humbled.